as Jenny just said, uh, I'm Martha, and I taught the Virgil AP for approximately 20 years in a public high school in Southern California. In the early years, I began with only a handful in a combination class. And then as I became more comfortable with the curriculum and the student, the student scores got better and better. And then the last 10 years or so that I taught AP, I had, um, I had a class with anywhere between 30 and 40 students in a class and was, was really proud of how well the students did on the AP exam. And I really think that a lot of that has to do with the Cambridge Latin course. So Jenny, let's take a look at that first slide. It took a long time for me to realize as a, an AP teacher that, that preparing the students for AP does not begin in the year of the AP exam. It really begins in Latin 1 and it continues throughout the course. And I just can't emphasize that enough about understanding what your end goal is and understanding what students are required to do at the end. And you need to work with the students baby steps, if you will, throughout the entire course. So on the next slide, as you can see, how does the CLC actually prepare students for the AP exam? Well, the Cambridge Latin course is a reading comprehension based text. And we know that the exam itself is about 70 to 80 percent reading comprehension. And the Cambridge Latin course integrates the language, the history, the culture from the very beginning using the historical characters in as much authentic Roman subject matter as possible. Uh, we know that it's set in the context of the Roman Empire and those historical characters are frequently introduced. Uh, unit one is based on the familia of Lucius Caecilius Eupendus, whose house and business records survive in Pompeii in the first century AD. Unit 2, which is set in Roman Britain and Roman Egypt, and then Unit 3, which is set in the city of Rome. And so the AP exam also requires students to relate the Latin texts that they read to the Roman historical, cultural, and literary context. And also, CLC introduces from the very beginning common phrase and sentence patterns of the language in a very controlled and gradual sequence. And likewise, the AP exam requires students to identify grammatical elements of it, the text and explain the meanings of words and phrases in context. So let's take a look at the next slide. So specifically, what are students asked to do on the AP exam? Well, they answer questions about vocabulary, syntax, grammatical terminology, political, historical, cultural context, uh, scansion of its poetry, the stylistic features, and just general comprehension on the multiple choice section of the exam. That is 50% of the exam itself, and that is something that, that we incorporate in the Cambridge Latin course really beginning with, with stage one and working throughout the course. The other part of the exam is to provide two literal translations from the course syllabus, one from Virgil's Aeneid and the other one from Caesar's Gallic War. And Donna's going to show you a little bit about how to deal with literal translations right from the get-go. And then, <clears throat> The third part of the exam is to write an analytical essay from two excerpts that are provided from the reading. And students have to provide a very detailed analysis of the text and refer specifically to the Latin found in those excerpts throughout to support their arguments. And in uh, this analytical portion of the exam requires focused practice in order to express critical and reflective reading. And Larry is going to give you examples and show you how to do that momentarily. 
And then the very last part of the exam is answering a series of questions, including a literal translation, a grammatical constructions, a contextualization, and connections to the English readings. And those last two questions of the exam only make up about 15% of the exam as a whole, and that's really where I'm going to start and show you what those last two questions on the exam look like and show you how you can incorporate that from the very beginning of the Cambridge Latin course. Uh, Jenny, let's look at the next one. Oops. So here's an example from question number four on the the AP exam, and as you can, it's considered a short answer question. And just take a look at some of the things that student, uh, students are asked to do. Name the speaker. Um, write out and scan if it's, it's poetry. And in question number three, notice it's, um, it's just a general question, but, but notice then that the students have to actually write out the Latin that supports the answer. And that's a, a really big part of the AP exam is supporting your answer with the Latin. And there's the translation question. And then if you look at question number five, um, here's a, a good why question. So this requires a little bit higher level thinking skill on the part of the, of the test taker. Question number five looks very similar. So this one is from the Virgil. And let's look at question number five. And as you can see, it's very similar. There's the why question. Uh, who is the speaker of the words? Another why question. And number four, there's translating um, identify the grammatical construction, <clears throat> and then lastly, give a specific example. So these questions number four and five are very, very focused. And this is something that you can begin doing in the Cambridge Latin course, beginning in stage one and as early as stage three. So let's take a look at a story in stage three on the next slide. So here we have the story Tanzor, and notice the questions that are already provided for you. And once again, we see a lot of these same similar type questions that we just looked at, which were part of the AP exam, the, those number uh, four and five questions. So there's our who question. And uh, number two, notice that we've got the why question. Students read the paragraph and explain why. And you can step it up a notch. If AP is your end result, you could also ask uh, students to, to provide the Latin that actually answers that question. I'm sorry. I'm saying. I'm sorry, Martha, I'm interrupted because we have a couple of people who do not have audio. They can't hear you. I'm just, give me a second to see if I can figure out why. Um, I'm see not see a way to fix it for them, unfortunately. Um, give me one more second. Um, I'm sorry, those of you who are not able to hear, I'm not able to figure out how to make you hear. I don't see any way to fix that. That was something. Um, all right, so Martha, I'm going to let you continue. Hopefully, they can get it in the. Um, oh, go ahead. So as you look at the rest of the questions that, that are given, uh, hopefully you will see some similarities between these types of questions versus what we just saw on the AP questions number four and five. 
there are a number of these conference attention questions that are already written for you throughout the course. Um, in Unit 1, for example, in, in Stage 6, there are questions after the story, Awaros, and in Stage 8, and Stage 9, Stage 10, Stage 12. There's So there's at least one set of questions for almost every stage in Unit 1. But if you are an AP teacher, this is something that I would encourage you to do and uh, come up with your own comprehension questions. Take a look at questions number four and five on the AP exam and try writing some similar type questions to get your students to practice so that by the time they actually get to the exam, they'll find that part of it pretty easy to, to uh, work through. So on that note, I'm going to pass the baton to Donna, who's going to um, tell you a little bit about chunking and answering questions. Um, good evening. I'm Donna Gerard, and as Jenny said, I'm one of the three consultants. Um, I've been teaching AP since the late 80s, and I started doing it at first because I knew I could have smaller classes. Sorry. Um, teaching using AP than I could if I just called it Latin 4. Um, and it grew from three students to having two, class full, uh, two classes full of AP students by the time um, I left the high school. The um, things that Martha has said are so true, it's not easy to um, teach AP. The teacher has to be familiar with the material and the students have to be willing to do some extra work that um, is required just like the, if they were in a college class. The 70 to 80 percent of the test is of course reading comprehension but part of it is translating. So I never give a translation in any place um, to my students that they have to hand in that I don't do chunking. So let's look at slot, the next slide, Jenny. This is a story from um, stage 20. And I would have assigned this portion, and only this portion, as a translation for the students. Chunking is what the AP um, graders use for grading translations. And at first, I thought uh, I also was a, a grader for several years. And uh, by the way, if this opportunity happens for you, um, I certainly encourage you to do it. I encourage you to sign up for it. It is very good for your Latin. It's very good for your understanding of the AP process. And it's a wonderful experience for the collegiality between high school and college people. But back to the chunking. So the, Chunking is graded, the way that translation is graded is chunking. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll do it. Um, what I found was that it's up front a little more work for the teacher, but in the end, it is a much more efficient way to grade. And it, it, it's fine. And a much more, um, it's much more easy to explain to your students what they did wrong. When I first started grading translations, I put lines under things and marked them. And they said, what did I do? What did I do wrong, Mr. Gerard? And I was like, you missed something. Um, but with the, with the chunks, then they know exactly what they did wrong. And it, for, for me, it was an all or nothing. They either got the chunk right or chunk wrong, just like they do on the AP exam. Usually chunks, well, chunks are always thought processes, what words go together. They usually, um, not one word and not more than four. So if you look at the next slide, you'll see the chunks for this passage. Well, there's 25 chunks. And of course, I just broke the rule that I just told you about. Um, but I did it for a reason. I wanted to pull out some of those verb tenses and make sure that they were translating their verbs correctly and not being sloppy between imperfect, perfect, pluperfect because that always makes a difference. Also, those terrible, terrible adverbs, the igitours and yams and 
all those words that give them fits, tandem, um, are also pulled out because I want them to look specifically and make sure that they knew the meaning of those words. Um, and I can't operate on um, an uneven number of chunks, so I always make sure that I have an even number of chunks to put on my test. And this, the translation for, for this would be a homework assignment, and it would just be a homework grade for the students. Next slide, please. This is the way the chunking looks for AP, and I have adopted the very same way to do mine. Um, you see the Latin to the left, and then you can write whatever translations you will take. In each little box, it would have a student's initial at the top, and you would mark um, every one that they got right with the one or a check, whatever your method was. Um, it made a very clear presentation for you when you looked at the whole thing to say, you know, I really need to spend some time on those deponent participles. They don't have this down yet. This is from stage 29. And again, I broke one of my rules. I just said this only has 14 points on it. <laughs> so I would add one quality point. Sometimes kids got um, the translation, did a very nice job with the translation, but missed something, missed several somethings. And so this was a way of rewarding them for doing a good job on the translation. And then, of course, there are other times when the kids got the individual phrases correct, therefore they've got a high score, but they missed what the, what the translation really was. So I would add a quality point. So that would be worth 15 points. Um, you can add any number. It doesn't matter if you want to add five. It doesn't, doesn't matter or three. But um, I would add one or two quality points on each translation. Again, this is something that I would hand out and say, translate um, the, this last section of this story. And of course, the kids always say, you, you can't quit there. We have to finish reading this. Well, no, I can quit, and you translate it and find out what happened yourself. So um, that this addresses the, the translation section of the test. Next slide. Can I ask you a question before we go on? So, um, like here with this first one, you would um, you would you would write if there were two different ways to say this, you would write them both here, so you knew what you would accept. Right, exactly. Okay, I'm we sorry. Are or we are those who. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. All right. And that, okay, that makes sense to me now. Okay. Now, this is an extra story. You can find these diagnostic texts in Appendix um, A of the teacher's manual. And there are wonderful extra stories to have um, for those times when you have time, and I usually do, to read another story or you need them to have more practice with reading comprehension. They're written, of course, in Cambridge style with Cambridge vocabulary, so it makes an easy fit into your class time. And you can tell by the very first word that it goes along with uh, the Modestus and Strithio stories in um, that section of the book. So this would be um, sometime after stage 22. Um, so they have this, there are three sections of this story, and this is the first section. And you can use it as a reading comp. Next slide. And ask these questions. And again, this is practicing using the Latin that they find in the story and tra translating it just like they have to do on the AP exam. They need that practice to smoothly put Latin inside um, their sentence. They, they can put it in parentheses, they can incorporate it. It doesn't matter to the AP graders 
but it does matter to how what their flow is and what their sense that they can make out of it. So this is six questions you could ask about that previous story. The next one. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going back. No. And then this is another section of that story. It goes on. And so I only picked out a couple of questions for this small section. But that isn't um, what, what you need to do for AP. They can answer these questions. These are really pretty straightforward questions. It's the next slide that <laughs> um, answers the questions, that asks the questions, sorry, that you more need to ask. You want to look at the whole passage. What in the passage shows you Modestus' character? And they have to start at the beginning and make sure that they go throughout the, the passage to answer the question. Um, that compare, there are lots of compare track story, uh, questions on AP. What's the significance? They have to make an assumption and then prove their point. So these are the kinds of questions that you have to think about asking a little earlier than, this isn't, as I said, in stage 22. So we're at, we're at the beginning of Latin two, and they need practice and guidance to get there. If the students can't answer these, then that's the time that you want to teach them how to, how do I look at this? What do I do? What's, what are the, some techniques? for getting into a story and answering these kind of questions. Donna, these we, are higher level thinking skills. Yeah. We have a question here asking, um, how long an answer would you expect for some of these kind of questions? Um, really, a sentence or two is uh, all that I would expect. I'm not teaching yet how to write a paragraph or how to write um, an essay. I'm just teaching them how to look for things throughout the passage. If uh, in sentence number one, I might tell them that I want three things. I, I really didn't pay that much attention, but if, are, if there are three things, but, but what are three things that show you as character? Um, so that, that would say they have to write at least three sentences with three pieces of Latin included in there to prove their point. And they all, you always want them to, um, make sure that they prove what they're saying. They can't just throw in an et and say, well, that, that's a Latin word and that means something. So they've got to really use the Latin to prove it. So with the first question, looking for adjectives or a statement that describes an action he did that would um, to, to demonstrate some point of his character. Yes. So. And uh, I'll leave the last portion of this to um, the essay from Larry, who's next. But let me say one more time that um, if you have not been to an AP workshop, a summer workshop, it um, is well worth your time. If you're an a going to be an AP teacher or are an AP teacher, they're scattered around the country. Um, they're less now than there used to be, but Usually, school districts, if, if you are um, teaching AP, are willing, they have money set aside, and money comes from the AP back into the school, depending on the grades, to pay for materials and training. So um, I would always encourage you to go to an AP workshop. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to Larry. Larry, tell us a little bit about your background. Please. Okay. Well, uh, I'm actually a recovering English teacher. I spent a number of years splitting my schedule daily between AP English, uh, Latin, and gifted and talented English. And so I've got kind of a soft spot for the the essays. Uh, the last several years, I've been working only in the in the realm of Latin. And uh, let me add on to what a a number of people have mentioned already that if you have the opportunity to do some of the the readings and, and actually grade some of the, the essays, it is it is both eye-opening and helpful. So uh, with that in mind, I wanted to uh, go ahead and let's go to the next slide. Uh, in essence, I wanted to throw out the, 
the idea of what the essay looks like first on the AP, um, not knowing whether people have seen it. The students will be given two passages if they are taking the AP exam, possibly one from the Aeneid, one from Caesar, uh, passages that they, they should have read throughout the course of the year. But they may also do two passages from the Aeneid. Uh, just recently, they did two passages from Book 5 of Caesar. But in essence, this boilerplate seems to show up every year. And as you can see, they want the students to refer specifically to the Latin throughout the passages. And they need, as Donna suggested, they've got to be able to support the points that they're making in those. And they do not want just simple summary. They want to see some evidence of analysis. So when we were thinking about making the transition between the Cambridge course and the AP kinds of things that they were asked about, I thought those two big issues are a great place to start, trying to teach students how to pull information from throughout the passages and what can they do to avoid just simply summarizing. So Jenny, if we can go to the next one. This is a 2013 uh, chunk of text. It's one of the texts that they would have been given. And of course, what they would have been comparing is a, uh, a leadership style of Dido as, as compared with Caesar. Uh, I only brought put one of the passages up for the purposes of ease. But what I like to encourage my students to do when they are working on the AP level is to make sure that they are physically marking pieces of that passage. So here's the actual quote, for, uh, the passage from the second book of the Aeneid. And I want them to think about at least three chunks, so a beginning and a middle and end. And I've gone ahead and put over on the other side, sort of color coded. Uh, probably the higher end essays are pulling out of every three or four lines. And some of them may be able to pull information out of every couple of lines. But I want them to actually mark those off on their paper. And I use similar things when I'm teaching the Cambridge course. In fact, in just a moment, we'll be looking at some text from stage 22, uh, where we have the in information about the, the fixiones. But I want them to actually mark these things down. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide, Vinny. And so as a setup, if you have the AP Latin course and exam description, uh, if you don't, you can actually uh, download it as PDF from the AP website. But they have basic themes, uh, including some essential questions like what roles do the gods play? How are these gods perceived? And how and why do human beings and gods communicate with one another? Which leads very nicely into a question that is asked on page 30 of the teacher's manual that comes with the Cambridge Latin course, which is, what does the use of depictione suggest about the popular conception of the gods? So what I might do and have done is to pull uh, a couple of out, uh, couple of quotes out just to sort of take, as Martha called, the baby steps of getting these, these kids ready for this, this kind of uh, uh, analytical approach to the literature. Jenny, if we can have the next slide. So here are, and they are, they are not contiguous, but a couple of quotes from the story Wilbia in stage 22. And you have Wilbia who is, is talking about this wonderful character that she's just met in her father's bar, and Rubria who is uh, perhaps a cooler head and, and is uh, a little more concerned about some of the, the, the possible outcomes. And if we can go to the next slide, what I've done is, uh, asked my students to look at these passages and I want them to actually underline what they could talk about that might address the issue of the divine or how the gods or supernatural powers might intervene. And so when I've done this, they've identified the nature of the sacred water. They've identified that Modestus is praying to the goddess and uh, apparently has uh, recovered or at least told people that he's recovered. Rubria. Of course, the, they pick up on the fact that fortune is sometimes presented almost as a personified goddess in her own right. And so when she says fortune favors you, they, they've identified that as something they could talk about. And also that this character, Bulbus, seems to have some means of communicating with powers beyond himself because he understands how to do magical things. And so it might be rather dangerous. And so those are excellent places for them to, to literally underline what they're going to talk about if I ask them about this, this kind of involvement with the divine. Let's go on to the next one, Ginny. 
Also, we have uh, the 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 forlorn uh, boyfriend who is, of course, gambling and uh, perhaps uh, drinking his his troubles away, um, perhaps not terribly successfully. And again, I would have the students look at this passage and ask them, all right, with these two guys in their conversation, what would you identify as good solid Latin support that there is some involvement with the divine or the gods uh, beyond uh, just sitting around in a bar? And let's go to the next one. And of course, they picked up the idea of fortune or luck possibly being a Thing that they might want to discuss. And of course, Bulbus is, has actively sought the help of the goddess. And of course, he's done this through one of those cursed tablets that is now lying in the in the, the goddess's fountain. And this even ties into the concept of do with days. I give so that you may give, so, as he suggests at the end, that he is eagerly waiting for the ruin of Modestus, little realizing, of course, that Modestus is standing behind him when all of this happens. So once they've identified those, uh, we need to get them not only citing those correctly, but we need them discussing them in some detail. And so if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to completely steal. Um, so, oh, yes. Before you leave that slide, okay. how many of the students are hooked in the circle underlining hair clay? Because they realize it's oh. circular. I mean, you know, I could just see my students doing that because it seems like a guy. Right. Well, it actually, I suppose, uh, what I've done is I, I addressed that uh, it is, it was originally a curse in a way. I mean, it, it's an invocation, but it doesn't really do much for our purposes. Right. Because what you can do is follow up and say, okay, if you underlined hair clay, you want to address it, how does it actually? tie in, or is it some sort of interjection? And so we can talk about how the, the language has changed from things that may have actually been originally curses to things that are just sort of uh, uh, mental little hiccups or interjections. But you're right, uh, you'll, you'll get Heraclite as part of that because obviously Hercules is now a deity. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that along with that, then that really is an encouragement to the student to look past what might be an, a simple answer. Right. I found a guy right. who circled it, you know, um, which is what you were saying before about summary, that you have to go deeper. Right. And that's really what we want to do is guide them to something that's a little bit more than just cherry picking Latin that they happen to know, although, you know, that, that certainly happens. But, but, again, that's not going to get you very far in, in this kind of assignment if you're just sort of pulling out, as Donna said, the et occasionally uh, or, a, or the occasional haircut. Let's go on to the uh, the next slide. And Jane Schaefer had come up with what I find is a, a fairly useful kind of model for writing a paragraph. And again, your English teachers are probably familiar with this. And depending on your age, you may very well have come through this, the system having learned this. But she suggested a, a simple formula that they can follow, which I, I think pulls them beyond just simply quoting the Latin and summarizing it. One of course, is, is coming up with a topic sentence where they would interpret the material. So our question is about the depictiones, the concrete detail that Schaefer would want, uh, and for our purposes, would be either the close Latin paraphrase or the Latin citation, the what that would tie back into our involvement with the, the powers beyond us. And then Schaefer wants two sentences of commentary that would essentially answer the question, so what? So he has thrown a cursed tablet in, or oh, the, uh, he, has, he has sought help from the goddess. So what? What does this suggest? And so a couple of sentences that follow up on that, uh, if you can get this idea sort of ingrained in them, that just simply finding the Latin and translating it isn't enough, they need to actually discuss and analyze what's going on, and ideally, be able to come up with some sort of closure or a concluding sentence with even the cat, uh, a couple of tags there for you as a result or therefore. And so we, we need to have that, that step from the quote or the paraphrase to the therefore stage. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, may I interrupt again? I'm sorry, yes. you're making me think of things. Um, the instructions in the AP say that they can list line numbers right. uh, and instead of writing out of the Latin, and I got to the point where I didn't let them do line numbers. 
um, I made them write out the Latin because I felt it made them more secure with their Latin. Um, I, I, I agree. I actually just got through grading a very similar exercise with my AP students last week, and that was one of the things I mentioned to them to remind them because I think not only does it make them more familiar with the Latin, I think it really causes, it forces them to isolate, again, what they're going to be talking about. Because you can end up with what I call it static, but a lot of additional stuff that can be sort of dredged in if you're just quoting line numbers. And, and I also think if you're, if you're grading these things, sometimes you'll see a student say, well, in lines one through five, they say X, Y, or Z. Well, that may be a, an awful lot of, of Latin territory that they're covering when it may actually be about three words that they need to cite. I would rather see them be more specific, and I, I always encourage them to do that. Um, and the other thing is that we never cared, I don't know if they do now, whether they wrote a one-paragraph essay or a three-paragraph or a five-paragraph essay. Right. It was the format of the essay, it was the content of the essay. Right. Um, I just like them to have a, a a template that they can fall back on because I think it's 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 fairly nerve wracking uh, during the AP exam itself to be confronted by the text, especially if you haven't seen it in a while. And so, if you've got something that you can sort of plug into, it can get you through that. So this is this is just sort of a uh, a, a template or a guideline that they can they can make sure that they're not just simply pulling Latin out. But you're exactly right; it's not. It's it's not like the English exams. Um, you will see, I think, in a lot of the grading rubrics that they need to draw general conclusions and they need to have some sort of, of introductory thesis for them to really get up into those higher realms of achievement. But you're right, it's not like they're needing a five-paragraph essay. Right. I also think that if you want to build the best essay for um, your grade, in a way, you're making it easiest for the grader if it's all right there and you're not kind of half referring back to a citation. That's exactly I know it, it just pulls, you know, when I read people's work, if I have to start flipping around or think or even flip to another page on my desk, I don't know. It doesn't make it feel cohesive to me. And I would think if I was working with kids on this kind of thing, I'd want them to give themselves the best shot. I think that's exactly right. I, I, I don't like throwing the term around, but I do tell them that there is a sort of a halo effect that comes from wielding the Latin efficiently. And so, as you say, if you're having to flip back and look at the passage and see if those those citations actually are in the lines that they that they uh, they mentioned, it pulls you out of the essay. And so, if everything's right there in front of you, I think it 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 speaks to a a student that is much more confident with what they're doing. And again, you can start. With, with fairly simple baby steps, just getting them used to being able to cite the specific things they want to talk about and then moving on into an analysis of them. Well, and going back to what you were saying about um, looking at Latin in a Cambridge text, you know, there have been times when I've had an answer in my head that I think is the answer to one of the questions. And the student who can say, yes, but, he didn't he say blah, 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 you know, up here in Latin? And he gives me the information I'm more likely to respond, you know, and take, but if I have to start looking myself and, and it takes me out of my flow as a teacher, I'm not as quick to want to, you know, deal with that. And so I think, you know, sometimes it's a sad thing to say, but in life you also have to be um, conscious of the impression you get. That's, uh, that's exactly right. I mean, communication is, is a combination of the information and the presentation or the delivery system. So I think you're exactly right. Shall we move on? Uh, let's do. If you if you have students that are not comfortable with the commentary sentences or not quite sure what they need to be doing, this is a little list of phrase formulas that Dane Schaefer suggests. Again, this is sort of lowest common denominator stuff, but if you can get them to start the sentences with this shows that, this suggests that, this is important because then I, I sense that they are being forced to move beyond just simply citing a, a, a Latin word or a phrase giving a translation or a paraphrase of it, and then moving on. If they, if they have a few of these in their, in their quiver to pull out, then it gives them, again, uh, something to hang on to that will pull them into the realms of analysis and discussion that they really need to be doing 
more than just, again, picking out words that they happen to recognize. If, I think it might be fun then to go back to some of the stories that they have much earlier in the course, and even as a one question assignment, start the sentence with, give them a little bit and say, this shows that dot, 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 and tell them to um, finish the thought. Exactly. And Cambridge is, is so good at following a, a line of thought. And, you know, I tell my students it's a, it's, it's a four-book novel that they'll keep those plot lines in the back of their head, and it may be a year down the road. You, can, you, you, you could certainly elicit that kind of response from a variety of the storylines. All right. Well, I just wanted to throw in one more thing. Thing. Um, if, if speaking of which, in fact, we can go to the next slide. Uh, of course, all of this had been uh, pulled out of stage 22. If one wanted to go back to stage 21, while we're on the subject of people that are engaged with the divine and trying to find uh, some sort of result or a, uh, a, a return on their investment as well. Of course, here we have the king discussing that he uh, is not feeling terribly well, but is seeking advice about where he may turn and, and uh, is interested in going to Akwa uh, He's He's been a, a good worshiper of the goddess in the past, and now perhaps she's able to, to take care of him. So again, you can reach back a stage or two and, and pull out other examples of this as well, which ties back into to, to, uh, Jenny's comment that you can, you can go back to other parts of this narrative and, and do that. What does this suggest? Why is this important? So I think that's what I had on, on an essays, but you guys have been wonderful about asking fine questions. Oh, look, questions. <laughs> well, um, the only question we had was, um, again, uh, how often do you, um, when, you're, when you're teaching the Cambridge Latin course, how often do you do the kind of um, essay that you were just talking about as you're teaching them along the way? With me, it, it depends on the level. Um, I do a lot of things that are going, for example, I think what might be called the short answer questions and spot questions, for example, like what Donna just showed us a few minutes ago. That's a great place to start because all of that builds nicely into the essay. So I may start in the, with younger students with that sort of thing. And then, uh, probably at least once in six weeks, I can pull some sort of text in before them and, and have them either work through it in class, which is what this, this would have been, or actually just uh, suggest, hey, you might want to give a close look at these stories because I've got an essay in mind and drop a few subtle hints so they'll, they'll be able to think about it. And uh, I, by the time they are in later, uh, in levels two, three, and four, I like uh, I like those things to appear on their tests from time to time so they get used to the format. Do you, this is my own question. Do you ever, um, somewhere in the course, walk them through writing an essay together? Yes, <laughs> that's exactly how we we uh, we tend to do that uh, a couple of times. In fact, because I want them to see what a, a Latin teacher might be looking for, which is very different than what an English teacher might be looking for. And then when we start moving into literature, um, especially, for example, uh, oh, if, if you're in Unit 4 and you're reading some of the things by Ovid and Marshall, that's a great place to really come up with some things where uh, we could discuss what, what Marshall's doing in his description of the palace, for example, in, in Stage 36. And so we'll sit down and we'll tag team with that. Okay. Uh, no, thank you, Larry. Don, I have a question for you. It says, how often do you do a translation? And I thought you didn't do translations in CLC. I don't um, do it very often. And I don't do translations as a group in class. It would be an assignment. And I might do it once. Every other stage, I might assign a translation. Even though I say I don't translate, I want them to know how to do it because my end game is AP. I want them to be able to be successful on that AP test. Um, so uh, to answer a part of what the other question was, too, is that I do essay writing oftentimes in 30-minute segments in class. 
because they have to get used to being doing a timed writing. Uh, they don't have a time to, to write a draft and write rewrite a draft and all those things when they're taking the AP exam. They just have to write. And so, and it's very, it's, Larry says, very different from English, but a lot of my sophomores and juniors would be taking a history course at the same time, an AP history course. And the writing on the uh, database questions, the DBQs, and writing for a Latin essay are very, very different. So I've got to teach them the differences between the two styles of writing, too. And can I maybe put this thought out and you can tell me what you think about this? We don't, with CLC, translate for comprehension. We read for comprehension. When we translate, it's to maybe display a, um, a level of clarity about how the language itself works. Yes. Right? I mean, you know, I would never want a, a child to spend 20 minutes just painfully trying to figure out what every word is saying um, so they can tell me all the grammar information or all that um, I'd much rather teach them to read, as you say, chunks than to look for context clues and all that wonderful stuff that makes reading smooth and quick and fun um, or, or entertaining, maybe. Um, and then when you go back and you look at the language and you say, well, what was happening there? In essence, you might be translating a few words. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I, that little tidbit that you're doing as a homework or as a five minute in class thing is really as much a checking for understanding, do you get all the fine details, right? You know. The other thing is that there's a difference between reading comprehension, understanding what's going on, and translating. Absolutely. Um, so, and they happen in two different places in the brain. So we've got to make sure that they can understand it, yes, and then the translation is a, you know, a different kind of skill. Yes. So we thank you for coming, and I thank Larry and Martha and Donna for being absolutely wonderful. Um, and we hope you'll be back next Wednesday.